Time again, kids. The time of the year where the weather gets crueler, the leaves start to change, and hack writer and director David Gordon Green gets to crap all over another classic horror movie and turn it into a bastardized shell of its former self. This Friday, his next victim, The Exorcist. And in celebration of this soon-to-be on-screen tragedy, I decided to pay homage to another movie he made, which also sucks really, really bad. A little movie called Halloween Kills. The movie that turned evil dies tonight and to a catchphrase populated the town of Haddonfield with the stupidest people on the planet <laughs> and made the watchers of the movie pray that Michael Myers would really exist and enter their homes to brutally murder them so they didn't have to remember watching this movie so what is it about Halloween kills that makes it so bad let's find out in this very special very spooky spoiler heavy review with activity <laughs> so as you already know Halloween kills is the sequel of the reboot of the two failed reboot movies that ignores six previous sequels from an alternate timeline and picks up where Halloween 2018 left off. As the movie starts, we get to check in on Cameron, the boyfriend of Allison, who stumbles across an injured Deputy Hawkins. And you may be asking yourself, wait a minute, how did he manage to survive being stabbed in the jugular and then being run over? Don't worry about it. We then flash back 40 years to 1978, the night of the original Halloween, where we meet up with a rookie Hawkins and his partner McKay as they try to find Michael Myers. Things then go quickly for McCabe, who gets attacked by Michael, but luckily for him, he has backup. But his backup is Hawkins, who is... But as useful as a cock-flavored lollipop. Now, why didn't Hawkins just walk up to Michael and shoot him in the face? Who knows? But don't worry, this type of critical thinking is par for the course when it comes to Haddonfield's finest. <laughs> as we catch back up with present day, we end up at a bar where Tommy Doyle, who looks terrible since the last time we saw him, gives a speech about the night of Michael Myers' attack that happened 40 years ago. And luckily, since no one apparently moves out of Haddonfield, his old pal Lindsay is there too. And also Marion. You remember her, right? The nurse who Michael attacked at the beginning of the first Halloween movie, who has no connection to this town whatsoever, and who would have no reason to know who these people are? Yeah, her. Why is she here? Again, it doesn't matter. After all, it's been 40 years ago. Cut again, because we've got a lot lot of ground to cover in this movie, and Laurie Strode is bleeding to death from her wounds that she sustained while fighting Michael Myers back at her house. As she, Karen, and Allison are being rushed to the hospital, the fire department is on the way to her house, which is now on fire, and where Michael is being held hostage in the base. Things then, for once, get mildly interesting, as Michael attacks the entire fire brigade. The first victim is the hose operator, who is apparently trying to take him out with a garden hose. Now, I'm no expert, but I have seen what happened to Johnny now. Knoxville when he got hit with a fire hose, and somehow Michael is just able to walk through it as if he's at a local water park. Anyway, all the firefighters die. Why? Because they all decide to wait for Michael to walk up to each one of them individually and murder them. Why do they do that? Who knows? But at this point in the movie, I'm starting to think that every person in Haddonfield had a mother who smoked while pregnant, because they are all so incredibly stupid, it's almost to an embarrassing degree. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. But hey, Dumb people make for easy victims. And speaking of victim, we now see Lori at the hospital. And we also get to see Sheriff Brackett, because why not? I mean, Mary and the nurse is in the movie. Why not bring this actor in that I'm sure everyone thought was dead a long time ago? I'm sure he will bring a lot to the movie and really help advance the story forward. Now he's turning us into monsters. <laughs> then we cut back again to the house of Lori's neighbors. They're funny, they're quirky. God, I sure hope nothing bad happens to those people. Oh! my god! So then, cut back to, again, all the people at the bar, and they find out that Michael has escaped, and they decide to go looking for him, because, you know, we've never seen that before. After some looking around town, they encounter Michael, who attacks them. Luckily, Marion is there, armed and ready to go. Unluckily for everyone else, Marion is really, really old, and apparently has dementia, because she just fires blindly everywhere. Thankfully, Michael is there, and kills her before she can kill anybody else. Then then this other guy tries to strangle Michael with a stethoscope. Anyway, while this stupid is happening, this happens. <laughs> 
a moment later, Lindsay gets to recreate a scene from Predator, and after Tommy finds her, he takes her to the hospital, where he sees Lori, informing her that Michael isn't dead. Then, Tommy goes into the emergency room, and leads all of the hospital patrons in their favorite football chant. Evil dies tonight! Evil dies tonight! Evil dies tonight! Evil dies tonight! And it just so happens that the chants attract Danny DeVito, and for some reason, they all think that he's Michael Myers, and attack him. So now we end up back at the newly remodeled Myers home, and we get to meet the new owners, Big John and Little John. What? Who are in no way gay stereotypes. What? And are quickly dispatched by Michael. Big John gets his eyes gouged out, and Little John just kind of stands there and lets Michael kill him. Why? How many times do I have to say it, people? It doesn't matter. This isn't a movie. This is just crap happening on screen. Okay! Back at the hospital, the angry mob, with Tommy leading the way, causes a man to jump to his death. And then nothing happens. Back at the Myers house, Allison, Cameron, and his dad, Lonnie, have figured out that Michael is still there. Now, do you think they wait for backup? Do you think they at least go in together so they can have safety in numbers? No! Why would they? Son of a Lonnie dies, who cares? Cameron dies, who cares? Then, as Allison is about to meet her end, Karen shows up and stabs Michael in the back with a pitchfork. How did she know he was there? Doesn't matter. Why doesn't she stab him in the head after he's on the ground? Because the script is stupid. It's written by idiots. Karen takes Michael's mask and lures him to where the angry mob is waiting for him. And then Sheriff Brackett says, It's Halloween. Everyone's entitled to one good scare. Oh my god! He said that 40 years ago! Anyway, the mob, who are armed with household items and no guns, decide to beat Michael to death. Seriously, this is a small Midwestern town, and none of these people have guns? Jesus Christ, say what you want about Halloween 4, but at least the mob in that movie knew how to do it right. Anyway, after getting a second wind, Michael kills everyone and ends up back in his house. How did he get there without anybody seeing him? Who knows? The place is surrounded by cops, but it doesn't matter. He kills Karen, and Laurie hears him do it, and God, I hate this movie so much. Now, I'm not gonna pretend like making a sequel to a horror classic is easy because it's not, which is why none of them have gotten close to the original Halloween. Instead of sticking with the slow burn atmosphere of the 1978 movie, they all devolve into horror schlock territory of Friday the 13th. And if that's the kind of movie you wanna see, that's fine. That's why those movies exist. They're all about the kills. But don't call that Halloween because that's not what Halloween was about. If you go back and watch the original again, there isn't a kill that we get full view of until the third act, and every kill that we do see is done fairly quickly and without any blood. They aren't spectacular, they aren't over the top, they're just matter of fact, and used sparingly to maximize the tension in the film. Ironically, it's what makes this so great that makes me think that if the original Halloween came out today, modern audiences would dismiss it as boring, just because it doesn't have gallons of blood or a jump scare every 10 seconds. Now you may be saying, Adam, it's just a sequel to a slasher movie. Why are you trying to hold it to some sort of golden standard? And quite honestly, I'm not. I'm just trying to hold it to the standards of a story. But there's no story here. There's not even a plot. I mean, a story has an antagonist. Who is it in this movie? It's not Lori, because she literally does nothing the entire time. She just stays in her hospital bed. Ironically, the character with the most motivation seems to be Michael. He's just trying to get to his townhood home and just happens to be killing people as he's making his way there. Now for you, this may be fine. This may be all that you expect or all that you want to see from a Halloween movie. But for me personally, the plot of Michael Myers kills Eddie it's just isn't enough to make a movie work. Everything about this movie, from the script to the acting, is laughable at best. And in my opinion, it's not worth watching at all, unless you just want to laugh hysterically at the bumblings of a hack director like David Gordon Green, who is almost certainly to repeat this travesty and destroy the legacy of another great horror movie in just a couple of days. And you can certainly expect that review when it comes out. Well, that's it for this one, guys. Have you seen Halloween Kills? What did you think about it? Leave a comment below. Let me know. As always, thanks so much for being here, and I'll see you next time.